there's an announcement by the British Met Office that they would review the series and then make a new temperature set. Now, one area of contention with it that you can see in the emails relates to urban heating. And I'll, I've included rural because it can happen. It, more generally, we're talking about land use changes. Uh, one perspective you can, you can make on this, which makes sense if we're talking about fossil fuels, is that in the US, our fossil fuel energy consumption now is three-tenths of a watt per meter squared. Uh, this is actually starting to get in the same range of the current estimate for the carbon dioxide forcing, which is a top of the atmosphere number, but uh, it's, again, it's a scale thing, which is 1.7 watts. Now, the issue is that the density of people in populated areas, even in, in rural areas, is about 100 times the national average. And so if you have thermometers near them where they're, where they're consuming fossil fuels, the question is, does the heat contaminate the measurements? Now, this is an infrared photograph from Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, what you, you can see in this picture, this is an airfield here. And then these are forests around, if you've ever visited that part of the country, the natural state is, is a, a complete dense forest. Now, the temperature difference between these two is 12 degrees C. It's enormous on any scale. Well, the things we're talking about, and the, just to give perspective, are in the range of half a degree or a degree or two degrees. Now, the problem is that half of the world's climate stations that are used in the series are actually at airports. Now, there's a question about, uh, Phil Jones has had a long-term interest in urban heating. There was an early paper uh, published in 1990 that compared pairs of stations in China, Russia, and Australia, and it did claim that there was little or no effect of, urban, little urban heating effect. With respect to the Chinese results, there have been a rather public criticism of these and, and quite a few papers that, that simply contradict the results. With respect to the Russian papers, there's one of the emails talks about writing a, a, a severe review for a paper that talked about uh, Jones's work about, related to Siberia. Siberia actually matters for world lamp temperature because it's such a large land area. Now, one of the papers, the author has uh, surfaced, and he, he's left the climate field at this stage, but uh, he's also submitted, his draft is now public, and, and, and the paper was rejected. Uh, that, and there was a sentence there that suggested that Jones's results, were, Russian results, were high because of urban heating. Now, after the emails were released, there's a list of the Russian stations that have been posted. The, uh, uh, Jones's Russian stations, and then there's been uh, an article from a Russian institute that it is, it's quite critical, uh, that claims essentially that the stations were, were cherry-picked. Whether the purpose is to give a larger warning, warming or not, the, the claim is the effect is to give something like six-tenths of a degree. Now, in the assessment report, um, there's one statement, and you may have seen this in the discussions about keeping papers out. These related to urban warming. These papers are published. Uh, and uh, in, in this case, one of the re reviewers objected, and so the papers were included as a, a brief reference, but then a sentence was added that simply said the papers weren't valid, again, without a, a reference. So it, it's, it's a very tough discussion in some ways. Now, the actual, uh, in the actual report, uh, Jones cited his own, the 1990 paper, plus a later one by Peterson, uh, and, and you can get the, the sense of the, the range here that it suggests it's roughly 10 times smaller than the trends that we're trying to identify. And there's another part of the report where the rise that's associated with urban heating is actually given a number, which is six hundredths of a degree per, per uh, C per century. My own sense when I look at that infrared photograph is that you would need a lot of, after I see a 12 degree C difference, you would need a lot of papers to show me that that was that small, that, that six, six hundredths of a degree. Uh, I'll give one more example here. This is a not a, an urban area in that, by that definition. It's, it's the climate station in my father's hometown. It's Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. And this is continental climate. The average daily, or January minimum is minus 20 degrees C. Now, what you're looking at here is this is the older station, this box, and then the newer station is the white bellows there. Now, what, why it's here is that it's, it's attached to a radio station. And then what, what you're looking at here is this is this red box here is a, is a cable tray that runs out to the antenna, which you can see in the, in the marsh. Now, I, I'm, my previous life, I was a, a transmitter engineer, and so this is the perfect place to put a radio station on the edge of, of a marsh. Whether it's the right place to put a climate station or not, given what happens in a marsh, I, 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 it doesn't see, appear to be. Now, online, there's been a little discussion of this station related to this air conditioner. It, it was on the roof, and then it was moved to the ground here, and then 
a couple of months later, you had a four degree C rise, which the surrounding stations didn't have. You can check the surrounding stations, so it was, it was a local effect. Now, this one's not really of concern to me because it happened so late that it doesn't affect a century-long trend. The one I was concerned about, and I didn't see a discussion, is this propane tank here. The station, if you look at the schedule, comes on the air at 5.30 a.m., and I, I, you know, the reporters are not working in minus 21 degrees C, and so the question is, does it affect the results? Now, here's the, the raw numbers for this. The, the, the top one are the July max, max, and those are absolutely flat for a century. 0.0, .0 degrees. The January minimum are 4.1 degrees C rise. These are different enough to me that I'm reluctant to even kind of average them. They're, they don't seem to be doing the same thing to me somehow. But what happens with this raw data is it then gets adjusted. And then after the adjustment, both the January and the July mean temperatures have a 1.6 degree per, centimeter, uh, per century rise. So they're, they're very large adjustments that are made to these numbers. Now, my take on this, and it may be my perspective as an engineer, I, I, I'm not a scientist, is that, you know, to me, the, the land uh, temperature, air temperatures data looks poor. And one issue, which we, we work pretty hard in engineering uh, to try to separate, is the people doing adjustments, the people doing, writing the IPCC reports, and sometimes the advocates, the people getting arrested at coal mines in the United States, are all the same people. And, and my sense is that there, there really are severe problems with, with confirmation bias in, in the, the papers. Now, one thing, ironically, given the discussion we've had, which really is, is, is quite, it, it's quite difficult, it's quite contentious, is that in 2008, after the assessment report, uh, Phil Jones published a paper for Chinese temperatures that made a, a comparison not between rural and urban areas, but to, to sea surface temperatures in the, the China Sea, and he found that there was a, a, an urban heating effect of about five, uh, five tenths of a degree C over 50 years. And so the way I'd like to approach the problem is use sea surface temperatures instead. Those are actually the ones that relate in a stronger way to the clim long-term climate dynamics, which is really from our time frame is, is, is valuable. On the other hand, there's still a warning here. What we're saying with sea surface temperatures is that we're getting the correspondence right between Ships in the sailing ships in the Royal Navy in 1850, wooden buckets, thermometers in wooden buckets, and 2010 with automated buoys transmitting to satellites. And just the warning, when you look at the English ones on the eastern side of the Atlantic and the American buoys on the western side of the Atlantic, it looks like there's a couple of tenths degrees. It's not that easy even to get those to agree. And so there, there is a, a warning here, but we're, we'll plow ahead. We, we really don't have a choice in some sense. Now, the model I'll use is a correlation model, and the, um, there are two parts to the model that come out of the fit. One is just an offset temperature, and, and any model will need uh, an offset temperature. And the other is for the sensitivity to the carbon dioxide. Now, climate scientists tend not to use correlation models. They, are, they have a, a, a large group, groups of people that work on physical models. Um, the reason I like the correlation model is it keeps the number of variables down, and it actually gives us a chance to get an estimate of the uncertainties from a statistical point of view rather than an expert perspective. Now, one issue that comes up is there are delays associated with the ocean, and I use a model by Isaac Held for this. Uh, there's there's two, two time constants in the model, one three years and one 60. The three years one really doesn't matter. Things are slow enough with fossil fuels and carbon dioxide that it doesn't affect things. Now, I'll, the 60 years has an effect, and I'll, I'll show it to you. These are the residuals, and just by comparison with our fossil fuel numbers, these are relatively large compared to temperatures we're interested in. You can see we go up to four tenths of a degree here with these up and down. But it turns out, just from the point of view of the, the series of these, they're, they're pretty well behaved, and you can do uh, the standard replications and calculations of confidence intervals. It's actually a nice data series. They're just big residuals. And what this means, I've, I'll, I'll show you two plots that come out of these. One is for the temperature sensitivity. That's this blue curve. And I've done it in the same fashion as I've done for the fossil fuels, meaning I unwrap it in time and see how, how stable it is and when things fall apart. And this one is really quite satisfying in the sense that I get back all the way almost to the Second World War before things collapse. The, the data themselves go back to 1850, so it's a relatively long series to do a correlation. And that, that makes sense to me. Really, big time fossil fuel production started around the world after the Second World War. Now, you can also see the computed confidence intervals. Now, in the early years, because those rep, these residuals are so gigantic, 
uh, they're really not very helpful. We're, in fact, it's barely positive here. But over time, if the, the statistics are cons consistent, even if these fluctuations are large, you can see this kind of narrow in as you go in. And now, they're less than the IPCC ranges, which are shown here, but they are entirely consistent with them. There's nothing that's outside of what they've suggested for their ranges. So, so here, we're consistent with the IPCC. Now, here are the projections for sea surface temperature. The blue curve is our projection, and I've showed the dashed one is without that delay. Uh, my, my personal concern when I look at the delay models is I, I'm just not sure we're really capturing the dynamics here. I, I just think the ocean dynamics is more severe and complicated than this. It's about a tenth of a degree, so it doesn't change any conclusion, but, but I think there is an issue in, in what the behavior is. Now, here, we are less than the IPCC numbers, and the reason is, as you saw, in that emissions, comparing to emission scenarios, we, we are producing less fossil fuels. Now, one other comparison you can make, the U.S. government, Obama administration, and the Australian government have committed at Cancun to limit the rise in temperature to 2 degrees C compared to pre-industrial uh, pre times. And this, apparently, we, we clear without any real change in policy. Now, this half degree or degree we're talking about doesn't really have a direct effect. Obviously, in our daily life, we experience much larger ranges than this. And so what, I, what I'll do to go forward is look at two consequences, of possible consequences of the temperature and carbon dioxide rise. One that would be considered uh, the, the most negative that, that I can find when I read the literature, and the other that would be considered a, a positive effect. This is, uh, sea level rise is probably the most visible public concern. This is uh, data from a tide gauge. This is Galveston, Texas. And this is a pretty big ri rise. It's six millimeters per year. Now, if you read the assessment report, uh, it turns out that this, these sea level rises in the assessment report are not corrected for land subsidence when, when the land itself is, is, is changing. And in Galveston, it, since the assessment report, there are now GPS measurements for the Galveston tide gauge station. And it turns out of that 6.3 6 millimeters per year, 5.9 plus or, plus or minus some things, is actually land subsidence. There's been oil production from that area, and that's probably one factor in it. Now, this is uh, the Sydney tide gauge, and this is a, an extremely good record. It goes back into the 1800s, and this one's quite consistent. I can't see any real change in a big break in the slope or something that's dramatic. And the scale I've chosen here, just to give a sense of the, again, perspective, we're this is the daily tidal range. So in 120 years, we've gone about 5% of the daily range. I like this as a comparison. In fact, when I'm talking in the US, I use Los Angeles, which has a very similar record. It's a little bit larger in Los Angeles. Because the main concern, I think, for sea level rise is two ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctica ice sheet. Now, people are measuring the mass loss from these ice sheets. Uh, through their satellites, the GRACE satellites, and there's a European one called GROSS satellites that's coming too. Now, my sense is that when you see the papers is they still haven't agreed on all of the calculations, and so we're, we're not seeing a, a, a complete agreement here. So I've given a couple of, of results. One, uh, but the, it's, it's convenient for Sydney because they kind of bracket it. One's a little bit less, one's uh, somewhat more. Um, than the Sydney rise. And so my sense is that if you ever see a big spike in the Sydney uh, tide gauge, that, that's what you could connect it pretty directly to Greenland and to Antarctica. Just to give some perspective here on the scale, and I'll, I'll try in another respect uh, with substance in the next slide. Um, the, this is six tenths of a millimeter per year. My, my hair is about a tenth of a millimeter per year. And so I, I also have the perspective, maybe I, I can wait till I don't have to describe the rise in terms of my, the thickness of my hair. Now, and, and also, there are a lot of cities that have had to deal with sea level changes that are much larger than this. Uh, the one example, it, it is, it's an extreme example. This is Long Beach. Uh, Long Beach is one of the ports of Los Angeles where I live, and it's the second largest port by volume in the United States. And Long Beach is also on top of the Wilmington oil field, which is one of the richest, at least in terms of barrels per oil per square meter, richest oil fields in, in the world. And they started pumping in the early part of the 20th century, and a, a large substance bowl developed. In fact, in the middle of the bowl, it was nine meters. It was it, not nine millimeters, it was nine meters. It's very large. Uh, 